um, a program funded by the UK government to catalyze market-based research for um, standalone solar um, products here in Nigeria. And we are across the 14 states, uh, countries in Africa. I previously also worked in the Rural Electrification Agency of Nigeria, and I'll be moderating this session today. So please, um, for our participants and attendees, please put in your questions in the Q&A session, and we'll get right to your questions after the panelists have spoken. So the topic we have for this session is turning challenges into opportunities for the last mile energy access in West Africa. So I'm going to um, have the, the speakers do a brief introduction of their bio, just basically uh, who they are, what they do, just a, maybe a 30 second to one minute introduction. Great, I can kick things off then. <laughs> Hi everybody, uh, my name is Nithya. I'm from Okra, so really excited to have everyone here. I'm the product development lead at Okra and we are a company developing energy access technology to enable uh, rapid last mile electrification. And we're very excited uh, to be entering into the West African markets as we speak. So looking forward to learning from everyone today. Good morning. Okay. Uh, Good morning, everybody. I guess we're, we're trying to randomly move forward. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm based in Toronto, Canada, but with a uh, long history in Africa. And I am a venture capitalist and I'm most associated with the term clean tech, which I coined about 20 years ago and more to come. Thank you, Nicholas. Can I have um, Williams? Yeah, thanks, Queen, and hi, everyone. Uh, I'm William Brent. I'm the Chief Campaign Officer of Power for All, which is a campaign of more than 300 organizations working to, to uh, mainstream decentralized renewable energy solutions in countries across Sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeast Asia. I'm based in Spain. We've done a lot of work in uh, Western Africa, including Nigeria and Sierra Leone, and we're beginning some work in Burkina Faso focused on healthcare uh, as we speak as well. So I'm happy to be here and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, Williams. Um, can we have Ifani, please? Yeah, uh, good day, everyone. My name is Ifani Orajaka. I'm the CEO of GVE Projects Limited, Nigeria. Uh, GVE actually is the leading uh, mini grid company here in in, in the country, uh, we pioneered uh, the mini technology here and still actively uh, have the highest installed and operational capacity of mini grids dating back to us as far as uh, 2013. Um, I'm really excited to be on the panel and I look forward to uh, learning and also sharing some of our experiences. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so great to know more about you. So um, just in West Africa, as we know, particularly in Nigeria, um, a large percentage of the population still suffer from um, you know, energy poverty. And um, there's so much that the government is doing, there's so much that the private sector is doing, and there's so much that um, international journals are also doing to ensure that we um, bridge that gap so particularly in Nigeria, the federal government of Nigeria has a goal for 100% electrification rate by 2040. And um, so with that comes a lot of opportunities as well as, well as challenges, you know, just basically across the value chain from, you know, infrastructure, technology, um, data, and, and the rest. So basically, even recently, there's the announcement of the 5 million um, Solar Nigeria program that has been launched by the government of Nigeria. And this is also um, very common, uh, very, um, it's very similar in across the West African region as well. A lot of African countries now are really looking at um, being active and seeing what we can do, how we can do a public-private partnership to um, ensure that there's a lot of collaboration to um, 
be, bring more energy into the space. So I'm just going to pass this to, to Mr. Baca to just um, talk more about um, his experience um, being a venture capitalist and um, basically what he thinks are the challenges he's facing as well as opportunities that lie therein. Thank you. Oh, before I go there, I think I see Ifi Malo coming. So, um, sorry, Mr. Baka. Before that, we'll just have Ifi Malo um, do a brief introduction of herself. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Ifi Malo, and I work for Clean Technology Hub. We're a hybrid hub um, based out of Abuja, Nigeria and working in the energy access and climate change sector. Sorry to have joined late. Thank you so much, Ifi. We're grateful to have you on here. So back to uh, Mr. Baka, please, would you um, be able to present or just talk more about, um, you know, what kind of um, investments you've made in the sector, in the space, in the ecosystem, and what challenges and opportunities you think lie therein? Thanks, Queen. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Uh, I'm going to take about five minutes um, of our precious time here to paint a story of why now, um, why the, the opportunity uh, for uh, what we're discussing today has really arrived. And, you know, we, we stand on the shoulders of others and we build off prior knowledge and experience. And I think history and context really matters if we're gonna understand why this is such a seminal, powerful moment for uh, what we're discussing today. Um, just sharing my own personal journey going back 40 years. Uh, this time 40 years ago, I was in South Sudan as part of a journey that started in London and ended up in Johannesburg. Uh, when I got to Johannesburg, I discovered what I was disgusted with and became very active in the anti-apartheid movement. And that kept me involved uh, for many years post uh, the uh, release of uh, Mandiba uh, and uh, majority rule in South Africa, it kept me very involved in, in that part of uh, the continent. And you know, back then, the idea that entrepreneurs had anything to do with ending energy poverty uh, 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 was just unheard of. The, the, it's hard to imagine today that at that time, the, un the understanding was that government was going to build uh, big centralized power plants and then build out the transmission and distribution into uh, peri-urban and, and rural areas, uh, which of course was never gonna happen and never gonna be possible. But that was the model, and it was in the early 90s that the Rockefeller Foundation funded a group that eventually became known as E and Co, uh, which had this radical idea that maybe entrepreneurs on the ground had something to do with uh, bringing uh, modern energy uh, to the unserved. Um, so th that's the early 90s, and Ian Co pioneered actually making these investments in Africa. Uh, the majority of their investments were in female-backed entrepreneurs um, through West and South and Eastern Africa uh, and Central Africa as well. Uh, their model ultimately failed because they didn't know how to scale and replicate, but we learned from them. Then you get into the early 2000s, and what was happening technologically was that advances in material science, biotech, and IT were enabling environmental technology to go from compliance-driven end of pipe to clean by design, and uh, clean energy obviously being at the center of that. Um, and so, you know, wind turbines have developed uh, uh, benefit from the improvements in power electronics and material science. Uh, everybody on this uh, webinar knows the story of solar, but I can tell you that when we uh, did the second ever solar IPO on NASDAQ in 2001, there was half a gigawatt of solar PV installed worldwide. Uh, and I think uh, 
you know, some countries are getting that done by lunchtime uh, these days. And, uh, and, and so, uh, and, and going public on a stock exchange in New York uh, was almost unheard of. In fact, uh, in a slightly um, humorous way, I remember the first analyst uh, that we presented to said, what's this PV thing? Uh, I don't see any present value from a financial standpoint in this. And I said to the CEO of the company of Evergreen Solar, we need to rewrite our presentation and actually spell out the word photovoltaic. Otherwise people will think we're talking about PV from a financial standpoint. So uh, I say all this and, uh, because back when we launched the idea of clean tech, first of all, it was very Silicon Valley um, centric. People had no idea at the time that places in the global South, let alone Africa, uh, we're going to be the, the frontier for where these technologies can be deployed uh, for reasons that we'll get into, I'm sure, uh, before this webinar is done. So um, since 2001, since we launched CleanTech, uh, over $200 billion of venture capital, i.e. innovation capital, has been deployed, not just in energy, not just in solar, uh, but predominantly there. And so it's not a surprise that here we are 20 years later and the costs for batteries and solar have come down by an order of magnitude, if not more. And so uh, why now? And that leads us to the tech. It's both clean tech has, um, has become more economical, but now we've got the arrival of the exponential technologies. Uh, and of course, Opera is a great example of how you use AI and machine learning. And uh, again, I'll come back to that. So I think there are four factors that, that shape why now. One is tech, um, both clean tech and uh, secular technology development. The second is entrepreneurship. And again, it's easy to forget that uh, 10, 20 years ago, startup culture uh, uh, wasn't a thing. And yet now we have startup culture around the world. Uh, and, and particularly in Africa, uh, it's very exciting. Uh, secondly, thirdly rather, we have the climate factor, which is now uh, becoming material, both in the capital markets and in policy circles. And then in, in this particular case, we have the situation of Africa, where uh, in, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, we have uh, greater stability in some parts of the region. Uh, we have uh, the leapfrog capability but I would also argue that we have a third generation now post-independence uh, uh, who are uh, trained and ready to, to go to market as entrepreneurs and to build their own countries. Um, and I think this third generation of entrepreneurs is vitally important. So where does this all add up? It takes us into the possibility for new models, new business models um, that were not viable 10, 20 years ago and capital formation around that. So these factors are now enabling companies like Opera Solar, uh, which we're gonna discuss, I'm sure, further, but also companies on elsewhere in the region who pioneered things like pay-as-you-go solar, uh, companies like Mcopa in, uh, in Nairobi uh, are a great illustration of things that you could not do 10, 20 years ago. So it's the marriage of the exponential technologies of fintech and machine learning with now uh, cheap and affordable solar and batteries that I think are leading to this tremendous uh, renaissance uh, in clean energy. So the, 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 the new approaches that are required uh, require a more holistic uh, uh, way of moving things. So, we are often good at developing technology, but not necessarily deploying it. We're good at innovating, but we don't marry that up to infrastructure. Um, and so figuring out how to bridge these divides, particularly at a time when infrastructure is increasingly determined as digital rather than physical, I think is critical. And uh, everywhere in the world, uh, my next observation is true, but I think it's particularly true in the developing world where 
there is non-financial capital that can bring be brought to the table, uh, social capital, relationship capital, intellectual capital that can be found in think tanks, uh, NGOs, um, public agencies, and elsewhere, and where we can harness uh, civic assets, um, uh, uh, citizen science, um, uh, community centers, and, and things like that. Uh, these are the kinds of things that need to come together if, if the promise of clean energy is really going to be manifested because it's not the energy we're seeking, it's the benefits from the energy, the healthcare, the economic development, the uh, educational possibilities. And so we need to partner with different players in order to scale. Um, schools may need libraries, um, but those libraries might be digital. Well, you need to power them uh, in a clean way, but we need roofs that, um, that you can put solar on. So you can partner with school boards and, and, and uh, educational institutions uh, to solve problems that go beyond energy, but require energy to get there. So really it's the marriage of the secular and the sustainable that, that is really what it's all about. And, and that's why I think the, the opportunity is now because we, we can achieve exponential impact with the tools that are, are available to us. It's not about the UNDP or the World Bank anymore. It's about the people that I'm looking at on this screen who have an entrepreneurial um, basis, have a, a, a sense of purpose, and who have the imagination and creativity uh, to do this. And of course, in West Africa and in Nigeria in particular, there's this tremendous history and culture of entrepreneurship uh, of uh, finding ways to make things happen. Women's lending circles go back hundreds of years in West Africa. And I believe that the key to success in, in the region of the world that we're looking at right now is to harness your own culture uh, and to put it to use along with the secular and sustainable drivers that I've just uh, highlighted. So I'll stop there uh, and hopefully that kickstarts our conversation. Awesome, thank you so much. That was that was um, wonderful. A lot of opportunities that you had put down there, you know, basically secular technology, entrepreneurship, um, climate change, and you know, just basically just how we can bridge the gap. So that's that's a lot being said. So we're going to move to uh, Ifoma Malo. Um, Ifoma Malo has a great experience in the Nigerian sector, um, in, um, also in Clean Tech Hub. So I'm just gonna invite her to um, come and talk about that. I just wanna remind us as well that just seven minutes, please. Thank you, Ify. Thank you, Quinn. Can everybody hear me? Okay. So I'm going to be um, speaking very briefly and very quickly about um, why there is a great importance in investing in this sector and uh, what kind of holistic investments we should be looking at and why that is important. So not just looking at investment from um, a very linear point of view, but looking at all of the parties that should be thinking about what the current energy transitions uh, mean um, especially for a country like Nigeria that is still very fossil dependent in many ways. Um, so I'll preface what I'm going to say with um, a webinar that I attended, I think last week, where, which had um, the head honcho for the National Oil Company in Nigeria. And for those people who don't know what that is, that's uh, the NNPC, the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, is the, you can keep the slides, uh, you can keep the slides, Queen, that's fine. I can just speak to the to the slides since we're going to be very quick. Um, and, you know, it was interesting to listen to that presentation and hear him say, um, amongst green energy entrepreneurs also and climate smart experts, that even within uh, the NNPC, that the Nigerian government is beginning to think about what energy transition means for its energy future. And this is the first time I think in my career doing this the past 10 years in, in Nigeria that I've heard somebody that senior uh, with a lot of political, political capital come out to say, well, 
we're, we're actually beginning to think, not just think, and beginning to, to put together strategy papers about what a shift from oil and from fossil would mean, mean for Nigeria. So you can see that this is a conversation that it's not just happening at a global level, but what the impact means for our GDP as a country, considering the fact that oil controls our GDP in Nigeria is already becoming the fulcrum of a lot of the conversation, the economic conversations that we're having. And that webinar also got me talking because it, uh, thinking because it also had quite a number of senior C-suite executives from the oil companies in Nigeria. So think about the big four. Um, and who also said that they had departments that were already thinking about energy transitions. Some of them talked about having renewable energy departments um, and what that would mean, what, how they're sort of thinking about what that transition would mean um, in terms of how they're investing for the future. Um, so for us, I mean, looking at, you know, what we do at Clean Tech Hub, I think these conversations have become not just an, a necessity, but has become an emergency um, in the way that we're, we're approaching um, Nigeria's energy future. Um, you would recall, for those of you who follow the news, maybe in Nigeria, uh, we recently increased um, electricity tariffs. And even though we know that those tariffs are high for a lot of consumers, there's still going to be increases that are coming down the road because, you know, um, these, have, these have been in the pipeline for so long and a lot of the, the discos have said that they cannot um, function effectively if they don't have um, some sort of increase in, in the tariff charges. So um, on the on supply side of things, you know, we, we see issues around um, VAT and import duties around renewable energy, beginning also to limit the, the way that people are able to um, accelerate the growth of renewable energy in the sector. So while on the, on the demand side, people want to transition because first of all, you know, the grid is inefficient. And secondly, with the increase in tariffs, they're asking themselves if this is worth it. On the supply side, well, you, you have the issues with our customs and the VAT and tariffs and the inconsistencies in policies, um, and as well as limited financing and credit facilities that are available for developers of renewable energy sources. Uh, and merging these two issues, then you see why, why we're sort of in a conundrum in terms of where we should be going when we know that there is a necessity regarding this energy transition. Then on the regulatory side, you know, we, are, we, we have a solid mini grid regulation that came into place between 2016 and 2017. Um, however, you know, the, the permit process, the application process to get those permits has been very slow. Um, and, you know, there's been, a, there's currently a lot of work ongoing to see how it can be less cumbersome. And I'm sort of describing some of these issues so that people would see how they sort of congregate at some level and how there is then the need, when we talk about investments, we're not just talking about financial investments, there's the political investment, um, and then also the social investment where we have to also have um, a collection of civil society actors um, and, and NGOs who have levers with uh, state actors um, and local government authority to begin to sound the alarm to make sure that we, we're, we're engaging with energy transitions and the acceleration that needs to be done um, across those investments, value chain, you know, are, are happening simultaneously. So, you know, why should we invest? Well, the, the, the reasons are clear. Um, inefficient grid, you know, high cost of, uh, of, uh, of uh, tariffs, and then at the same time, a lot of people without electricity across Nigeria. How should investment occur? I guess that's what we're going to be talking, talking about um, for the rest of this session. But I wanted to take time and just say that, you know, some of the work that we have seen and that Clean Tech Hub is currently involved in is actually a, a, a looking at a value chain, chain approach, both from the energy access, climate change, depending on which actors that we're talking to. Um, and, and looking at it from a point of view of why, how we should frame the conversations around investments. Um, and, and this is important because, you know, we're, we're an incubator, uh, first and foremost, and also we do a lot of research. And so as an incubator that started in 2016 and then had to stop and then sort of kick, kick back in in 20, 2019, we're now working with about 20 portfolio companies that we're trying to get 
um, ready for funding, for fundraising, um, and to be able to begin to be part of these conversations around solving the energy gap, energy access gap in Nigeria. Um, so it includes everything from, you know, working with them through all of their regulatory filings to, you know, the, the trying to design their business plans and operating models, um, and also uh, helping them to define what their target market and the market segmentation that they, they what market segmentation that they want to, to focus on. And, you know, in, in doing this work, we come across different types of business models that we think have become interesting and can help unlock each piece of the value chain um, in terms of what, whatever problems we see um, that are, are sort of creating the slow, slow movements, as we call it, um, in, in meeting some of the needs uh, of the energy access conundrum in Nigeria. Um, why is Clean Tech Hub doing this? Well, I think first of all, because we're all Nigerians, we live here, we feel the pinch. Um, but I think also because we see this as an opportunity where we, we can build an ecosystem of people who can do the work, um, who, are, who are actually invested in the country, um, and not just invested in, in terms of the business aspect, but invested in terms of understanding what um, having access to energy, access to electricity can do um, in building up an economy. And this is why we're also beginning to have conversations with, with uh, a lot of other industries, especially in the agricultural sector and, uh, and the smaller medium sized uh, um, enterprises to see how we can begin to connect the way that they think, the way that they do businesses, to what their energy outputs and needs are. Um, I'm going to leave it here because I feel like they're going, there's going to be a lot of questions as we go along. I'm very conscious of the time and I know that I'm right in seven minutes. So I'm looking forward to engaging more in some of those ideas that I've just put out here the past six, seven minutes. So back to you, Queen. Thank you so much, Ify. Um, as well said, you've spoken a whole lot about you know, the, the opportunities with oil, how the, the, the GDP of Nigeria is, is really being affected now because of the oil um, issues and oil and gas issues in Nigeria and how oil companies are now trying to open up departments for renewable energy. We talked about, you know, the difficulty with the mini grid um, regulation, getting the processes. You've talked about so much, even about the, the, the businesses that you're helping to incubate, 20 of them and um, the challenges and how you help them to surmount that, looking into how energy and its value chain can cut across other sectors like the agriculture sectors. So these are definitely um, valid, um, real um, issues that we're currently facing now. Um, we'd like to hear more about, you know, more opportunities on, as to how to mitigate these challenges. But we're going to just go uh, forward to hear more from uh, William Sprint to share Thanks, more Queen. about um, success stories on the energy access system. Thank you, Queen. Yeah, so um, I think I'd like to frame my comments uh, at a, maybe at a more macro level. Um, you know, Nigeria is such an important market uh, as it relates to, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa. As Nigeria goes, Africa goes. I mean, it's the, it's the continent's largest economy and two of the continent's biggest issues are electricity access and unemployment um, and how Nigeria is approaching uh, the question of uh, access to electricity, I think is gonna have major impact uh, on the rest of the continent and how successful Nigeria is in, in doing, in sort of this, you know, achieving this very ambitious goal that it's set out for itself with the Solar Niger uh, program that was recently announced. It's I think 5 million connections, 250,000 jobs. So I guess my, 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 my point of view after spending about five years in the energy access space now, uh, but you know, maybe 20 in the energy space overall is that uh, one of the key things that we should be thinking about, and I think Nicholas and Ify have both alluded to this is, is the concept of integration and integrated thinking. Uh, not just integration within the energy sector, which is critical, but also integration across uh, the different uh, off takers of the energy solutions that we're talking about. 
I come from the private sector. I think of, uh, you know, uh, the off takers of decentralized energy solutions as customer sectors, really thinking about them as customers that could be education, healthcare, agriculture, um, labor. Um, but I think that's uh, just backing up for a second, this just staying with the, the energy industry first and foremost, um, you know, what we've seen over the past 10 years as the off-grid energy sector has matured is that essentially you had the state-owned um, distribution companies and the private sector de decentralized renewable energy companies working in, 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 in separate lanes. Um, and I think that over the past five years, probably the past two years in particular, those two lanes uh, are starting to intersect and sometimes they're intersecting in a, in a nice fluid way, and sometimes they're not. Um, and, and Nigeria is, a, is an interesting case because they decide, the government decided very early on to take a, a private sector first approach to universal electrification. Uh, and the CEO of SE for All now, Dami Lola, you know, I think she was very much, uh, you know, the driver of that, that decision uh, and a champion of that decision. And that's what we're seeing sort of play out right now. Um, so Power for All is, is working on integrated electrification um, uh, in Uganda through our Utilities 2.0 program. But uh, in Nigeria, you have a company called Conexa, funded, spun out of the Shell Foundation, which is essentially taking all of the work that's being done around integrated electrification planning, uh, and that's happening across the continent, uh, and trying to actually show that there's actually a, a case for implementation of integrated electrification. So working with state-owned distribution companies to try to privatize some of those distribution networks, uh, or at least a, some sort of hybrid approach to doing that. And, and that I think is, it's unclear still today whether that'll, how that will work, whether it will work, what will be the pain points um, and, and what will be the successes. But I think the, the intent is what's important here, which is that if the, unless the distri distri state-owned distribution companies and the private sector DRE companies can find a way to work in a mutually beneficial way, we will fail to achieve the goal of universal electrification by 2030. So that, that I think is, is one aspect uh, of integration that, that deserves a lot more attention. Um, and we are in the process now of, of uh, you know, implementing a demonstration in Uganda that will be hopefully learning all kinds of, of, of insights that will be able to point to what, that mu what those mutually beneficial inter um, interventions uh, can be. The other uh, point of integration that uh, Ify alluded to was around agriculture. And in Nigeria, I think about uh, you know a third of the, uh, maybe a, a quarter to, maybe it's around a quarter of the population is employed in the agricultural sector. I think uh, a, a large percentage of GDP has also contributed to Nigeria's uh, economy from agriculture. And for mini grids in particular, um, the, there won't be a viable business model unless the demand uh, generation uh, issue is resolved. And agricultural and food systems is going to play a large uh, piece in, in so hopefully solving that demand issue. The energy sector, generally speaking, is a supply side minded industry. It really needs to take a much more demand side uh, uh, approach to solving the issue of how, in this case, smallholder farmers uh, are able to actually scale, not just irrigation, which is sort of the low hanging fruit of, of the, agri the, the food value chain, but also agri-processing and cold storage. And so that's a, another area that deserves a lot more attention. It's an area where we're working extensively this year is the UN Food System Summit. It's also the high level dialogue of energy on energy, both UN processes and we're smack in the middle of those two trying to make sure that at the international level, that integration is happening and, and the, there's consensus about what needs to be done. But we're also very aware that that needs to happen at the country level too. And it's, in, and it's exciting that Nigeria is now in the process, I believe of, of launching or at least framing an energizing agriculture uh, initiative. Um, anyway, so I'll, I'll stop there. I think um, just to reiterate that, that you know, this uh, all, is all about 
uh, integration. And, you know, if we're going to succeed, not only do we need to plan for integration, but we have to be able to implement it as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, Williams. That's well said. Um, integration is very important. Um, um, it's, you can't really over, over, overemphasize that um, more of the um, public and the private coming together and, and decentralizing the um, decentralizing electricity. So looking into um, how we can get more um, mini grids into these rural communities where you know they are underserved and unserved and also solar home systems or solar standalone systems um, into these areas using um, also agriculture um, and knowing that the food security is a problem um, going forward and just um, seeing how we can actually achieve universal electrification we need to do more integration thank you so much Williams I'm going to move now to Ifai Ifai Orajaka is um, one of the four founding developers, mini grid developers in Nigeria. And he's, um, he's has a lot of mini grid deployed in the country, as well as won a lot of awards. If I please, can you talk more about the challenges you, fought, you face in terms of implementation of these mini grids in the rural areas and um, just other areas that, other issues that we, we overlook that actually are very important. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Queen. Uh, good afternoon again, uh, everyone on the call. So, uh, uh, it's been a really uh, interesting discussion so far, and I will just uh, uh, bring the private sector on the ground, boots on the ground uh, perspective to, to things. Uh, GVE actually started out uh, sometime in 2009 when uh, three young undergraduate students. Uh, uh, of one of the leading universities here in the country uh, saw like 100% energy energy uh, poverty firsthand and decided to uh, leave uh, chasing a career in, in, in the oil and gas industry to actually provide, work towards providing a solution to, to this. And one of the biggest drivers for that decision was uh, came in 2000 and uh, 12, early 2012, uh, late 2011, when we threw a study that was done by uh, Deloitte and funded by the Bank of Industry of Nigeria at the time. We got to realize that these challenges that we saw in some of the communities in the Delta, where they had absolutely no access to electricity, uh, is actually beyond those communities, but it's the reality of uh, Forty-five percent of Nigeria's population, just like I and and my uh, founding colleagues, and uh, we, we we thought that was really abnormal. And with as engineering students, we felt we can perhaps lend our voice to, on on this. Maybe initially was to uh, start up uh, on a project basis, CSR at the time, and perhaps because we had no capital, we had no experience in running the business and perhaps uh, maybe one of the, the big corporations can uh, pick it up from there and, and drive the commercialization and scaling of, of that process. But along the line, we were motivated by some of the uh, preliminary support that we got from our early uh, partners who are still on board, some of which include the uh, Institute of Electrical Electronics Engineers through the IEEE Smart Village Initiative and uh, also the Bank of Industry in Nigeria is uh, then assessed to renewable energy uh, project. And of course, the United States African Development Foundation. And uh, these early supports uh, to a large extent motivated us to go beyond thinking that this can be just a, a one-off uh, initiative that we can showcase as a solution, as one of the many solutions to solving Nigeria's peculiar energy deficit uh, challenges. But being hands-on and leveraging on these supports, we actually uh, quickly realized that we can actually turn this into a, a, a viable commercial and sustainable like, commercial uh, opportunity and, and enterprise. And uh, we've been on that journey for, uh, our first mini grid was launched in uh, 2013. And as of date, we have uh, a total of 12 
with over a megawatt operating capacity in eight different states of the country, serving over 10,000 uh, households and businesses. And in, in terms of the challenges that uh, have we have faced developing and uh, scaling mini grids in, in, in the country, I, I believe it actually can relate to any particular challenge that you can you can think of from as as trivial or as uh, as important as the fact that as a, as a 2011 2012 when we were conceiving the idea of building out this mini grid, even the uh, regulator being NEC and the uh, Ministry of Power at the time knew absolutely nothing of what the technology is is, is all about. And that goes to uh, uh, shed or cast some light as to what the, uh, the ecosystem of the industry was about a decade uh, or so ago. And it, it's taken a lot of concerted efforts and uh, collaboration at, at different levels, collaborating, uh, openness, sharing information, best practices and uh, challenges and, and, and all whatnot with a diverse array of, of uh, stakeholders cutting across those in the financial world, those in the public sector, and of course, those in the multilateral uh, uh, sector to actually drive the industry to the stage where it, it, it currently is. And for, for us as GVE, what we perceive as one of the biggest wins of, of uh, the, the founding team of, of, of GVE is the, uh, can be alluded to the fact that 10 years after starting this, through the actions and, and the uh, uh, support of giving to building out the, the uh, subsector, the sector have uh, reached some sort of uh, maturity or, or great stage of being able to attract significant uh, amount of uh, capital, be it public sector capital, be it donor uh, funded uh, programs and also private capital and have also been able to attract a very uh, reputable uh, organization from several parts of the, of the world to uh, be interested in, in, in uh, participating in the Nigerian mini grid ecosystem. And one, one of those uh, can also be alluded to the fact that Nigeria's uh, mini grid uh, regulation, which is, is, is rated as one of the best uh, in, 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 in the globe, one of the best in, in, in the globe uh, uh, was able to see the light of the day and have to a, a large extent uh, driven some of the, the uh, growth we've seen in the past couple of years. And I, I would say it's not entirely, it's not been entirely automatic. A lot of consultation, a lot of uh, discussions, a lot of uh, feedback sessions and all actually went on behind the scene with uh, different stakeholders to be able to get us to the, to get us to the level of having that very near perfect uh, regulation. Although there are still a few gray areas, which as a, as a sector, uh, uh, they are, we are currently working on, on, on solving these, but uh, it, it, it's, it's a, it's, it can be a judge as uh, being a very significant step in, in helping drive the skill that we're uh, talking about. And going a bit further, uh, you, you can imagine walking up to uh, a bank or a financier and in, in, 2000 and, uh, in 2009 and saying, uh, please, I, I need some capital to finance a mini grid. First of all, one of the biggest issues uh, shock you would receive that the person doesn't even know what a mini grid is and that is entirely different from uh, the scenario we, we currently have where a lot of uh, capital from different sources are now being uh, uh, targeted or earmarked for, for mini grid development. So, it, like like, like the, 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 the policy uh, that I mentioned, it also took a lot of consultation for a lot of uh, convincing, like uh, openness to uh, the financiers to actually understand the dynamics of the industry, the uh, revenue model, the transaction dynamics, and, and all to be able to structure uh, tailored financing uh, solutions that can meet these challenges. And 
uh, along the line, there are challenges around technology, challenges around uh, uh, collection and uh, uh, how to solve uh, energy theft, and, and uh, equally changing the mindset of the people that actually they can use solar to generate uh, enough electricity that can not just provide them with lighting, but can also power the basic electrical appliances in their in their uh, various houses and, and uh, businesses, and w which is a sharp contrast to what they were used to about a decade ago, which was just using solar for street lighting, of which a lot of them uh, failed significantly. I obviously wouldn't want to go uh, in, in, into that as well. I don't know how, how much I'm uh, doing on time, but I believe these are some of the uh, early challenges that we have faced and looking into the future in the near future, one of the biggest challenge with, with the level of interest and the level of support that the sector is currently facing, one of the biggest challenge uh, uh, I foresee would be the challenge of capacity deficit. Because we, we need, with, with all the amount of capital coming into the country, we need as equally amount of, if not more, of uh, skilled personnel of various uh, uh, experience and, and, uh, and expertise to be able to help drive the level of, uh, of skill that we aspire to see as, as a country. Thank you. Thank you very much. I find it as well said. Thank you for talking about your experience and challenges having, you know, installed or deployed your mini grades in 2013 and having 12 of these mini grids in Nigeria. Um, we hear you when you talk about um, how the sector has opened up with, you know, funding from the public sector as well as international donors and also how it has attracted um, more um, reputable companies to come into the space, to, to participate and invest. So we know that um, there definitely is still more opportunities for us to bridge this energy gap. And um, we'll definitely come back to you to find out um, what you think about um, maybe perhaps like a revolving fund um, for mini grids um, deployment, seeing that the, the public sector can only do so much. Thank you so much. We'll be moving next to Nitya. And um, Nitya is the product owner at Oka Solar. So we'd love to know more about the product that Oka Solar is bringing into the market. We'd love to know more about the you know, technology behind it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Queen. Um, is it all right if, if I share my screen? And take over. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, I think you need to stop sharing your screen first. Perfect, thank you. Great, okay. All right, so yeah, thank you again to, to everyone who's tuning in. Um, it's, it's exciting to be here and getting to tell you a little bit more about um, the, you know, what we've learned coming in from the Asian markets and um, yeah, really exciting to, to be stepping foot in, in West Africa, especially Nigeria. So thank you all. Um, here we go. So not only do we want all off-grid households to get reliable and affordable energy access, but we need to make sure that this energy is delivered in a way that provides profitable and sustainable business opportunities for energy companies. One of a few big problems is that remote communities come in all shapes and sizes. Some houses are really far apart, some are close together, the load usage varies. So how do you design a network that serves them all profitably? That's the million dollar, or rather in this case, billion dollar question. It doesn't make sense to connect every single household to a traditional mini grid. Um, anyone on this call who has mini grid experience knows that uh, there is a really, really strong use case for mini grids, especially in large, super dense, high power consumption villages. But for those smaller cluster, uh, clusters, irregular layouts, it's really expensive to distribute power, excuse me. And it's complicated to predict the demand. And as an alternative to mini grids on the other side, we have solar home systems, which are flexible and are well suited to these types of communities, except that they don't provide enough access to power 
and support productive uses of electricity, um, kind of touching on what uh, William was talking about with agriculture and kind of these other demand side industries that we need to think about. And these solar home systems also don't scale as demand grows. So if we're gonna get 800 million people access to electricity in less than 10 years, we're gonna need something new. And what we need is a technology that's both flexible and plug and play, but also robust to provide grid-like power access and reliability. And this middle ground is an IoT solar charge controller that can act as a standalone high power solar home system, as well as a low voltage flexible mesh grid. As a solar home system, households should still be able to power big appliances, AC and DC. And these appliances like rice cookers, freezers, cold storage um, are what make the biggest impact on their lives. And then when homes are close together, it makes sense to connect the systems together, redistribute power and reduce wastage and losses, meaning that we can downsize panels and batteries while still increasing system uptime. Sharing power in this mesh configuration has another great benefit. It brings down the transmission and distribution costs. As you can see in one of our projects in Cambodia, the configurations of households vary. And for the connected systems, you can see that the power really doesn't have to travel very far, which allows us to reduce the size of the distribution cables. And by keeping the grid at a low DC voltage, we avoid the complexity of frequency and phase management, which enables local people from communities to operate the grids. And at scale, we can use, we use GIS and machine learning to detect rooftops and then pass this data through our least cost electrification algorithm, which identifies optimal configurations between standalone mesh grid, as well as centralized systems. And this automation and data analytics help our developers maximize their limited resources, reduces guesswork, complicated engineering, and enables as many houses as possible to get productive uses of electricity regardless of how they're distributed. And when we look at the breakdown of costs, the infrastructure required in these centralized systems to distribute power out to each home is a huge expense that isn't getting any cheaper even as technology advances. So we can compare that to in a mesh network where the panels and batteries are fully decentralized, bringing down the distribution costs. And ultimately the per connection cost comes down by over $300. Saving upfront costs like this is really crucial when we're talking about reaching the last mile. But in addition to bringing down the upfront costs, the ongoing maintenance costs can make or break the mini grids. Everyone here knows this. And this is where we can leverage the IoT data coming in from each controller in the field, process it through machine learning, data engines, and detect problems. For example, in the top data snapshot, we can see that a solar panel suddenly stops generating meaning that a wire probably came loose. But no one has time to monitor data from individual houses on a regular basis. Instead, our algorithms can immediately detect this problem and send it to a local agent, instructing them to the exact house, the exact cable that needs attention. This keeps costs low and helps resolve issues quickly. Another important alert is for power theft, which has already been touched on a little bit. As much as 10% of power is stolen on the main grid in the Philippines, and from what we're hearing, it's much higher in many African contexts. But we can detect if the battery is draining unexpectedly or if there's imbalance in sensor readings, and then send household warning messages and alerts to the grid owner, which help the utility recover revenue and also ensure batteries are being charged properly, which protects their lifespan. But most importantly, all of the behind the scenes analytics are automatically converted into clear, actionable insights. On our platform, grid owners can review the most pressing items. And then instead of sending costly engineers out to remote communities, every time there's an issue, they can pass these work orders directly to someone in the community. And that is really the key, the local maintenance agent who can both install and maintain these grids. This brings down transportation and logistics costs, creates local jobs and network ownership, and ultimately brings down OPEX. So together, local maintenance backed by automation 
results in 50% lower operations costs in comparison to just a traditional scheduled maintenance approach. From these low level alerts all the way to high level analysis of revenue and losses, the platform supports and guides developers towards running highly reliable and profitable grids. So I've talked about reducing CapEx and OpEx, and finally the last ingredient to really maximize profitability and scalability is revenue. And we saw a need to support highly flexible structures due to the constraints in every market. And this way developers can customize energy packages, tariff styles, um, excess fees. And this gives a number of options to manage demand, increase reliability and maximize revenues. Unfortunately, collecting small energy payments hasn't proven enough to drive profitability, which, yeah, which has been talked upon when we're talking about um, you know, joining with different sectors and, and actually bringing demand to, to the households. From pilot data, we saw that productive users, even if they're less than 10% of households, can generate more than 75% of the grid's revenues. So for us, this was a big opportunity to bundle appliance leasing with the energy payments. Now, developers can easily push more appliances, locally specific, locally um, kind of useful and contextual appliances to the communities without being burdened by the logistics and the risk of lease payments. And on the household side, they now get more opportunities to access and affordably purchase life-changing appliances. So I'll kind of wrap up there. It's no easy task to reach 100% electrification, but we see that the combination of lowering CapEx, lowering OpEx and increasing revenue, all while delivering high reliability power and creating local jobs is how we can achieve these ambitious goals. And as we speak, as I said at the beginning, we're really excited. Our CEO and partnerships team are in Nigeria right now, uh, kicking off our first pilot with GV. So you know, do let us know if you wanna meet up for a demo. And yeah, because we're ready. Uh, we're ready to work with developers, fill these gaps and make sure every household gets access to productive energy in a commercially viable way. So thank you, I'll end there and I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you so much, Amitya. Um, that was well said. Um, Okasula is uh, has come at the right time, um, knowing that um, we can't um, um, reach our hundred percent electrification rate at this rate of um, at the rate at which we're deploying mini grids and SHS solutions and giving the population ever increasing population in Africa. Um, so definitely, technology is a key driver to bridge this gap. Uh, so I have just jotted down uh, a few opportunities and challenges, and I just wanted to read them out. So for the challenges, we've been able to gather, um, you know, uh, climate change, um, increase in electricity tariffs, the VAT and import duties, um, slow, slow uh, permit process for the mini grid, limited finances, inefficient grid, as well as inadequate skill sets um, for the sector. And for opportunities, we've been able to find that there are, you know, um, there's, a, uh, there's new business models coming in, uh, there's um, finance capital formulation, pay as you go. We're seeing a move from physical infrastructure to digital infrastructure. We have social capitals, we have, um, you know, companies like oil and gas now transitioning, creating departments for renewable energy, uh, we need political investment. Uh, there's a need for secular technology. Entrepreneurship um, is well needed to bridge that gap. Value chain approach, you're looking into the agricultural sector and other sectors as well. They need more investment and more integration. Okay, so I'm going to um, stop now and just um, encourage everyone that's listening. If you have a question, please um, feel free to type that in the chat box. I'm sorry, in the Q&A box, and we'll, we'll have that answered by our panelists. So I know that I still have some open ones here, and this goes to Ifoma or Ni. It says, what do you think will be the future energy-driven rural economies powered by electrification in Nigeria? Do you think mass urbanization will be avoided by rapid electrification? 
Uh, I'd, love to jump in. I'd love to jump in on this because I think it's a okay, absolutely. Sure. I think it's a brilliant question. Um, and uh, I think one of the functions of COVID um, has been to uh, ask all of us to question our assumptions about the world as it is and could be. And the assumption has been that we're urbanizing uh, as part of development. Uh, we urbanize and uh, we're now seeing that technology, uh, in addition to uh, the risks of being in heavily populated areas, is making us rethink this. We're seeing in India now uh, what is what some people are calling re reverse urbanization. So if you can get educated, you can get health, uh, health things and drones can bring things into small villages, etc., uh, why would you want to go into a crowded city where uh, your kid's health is at risk, uh, security is an issue, etc.? I, I think we're seeing in both China and India uh, a policy response to this um, that, that basically stands all our ideas of economic development theory on their head. So I, I think this is a really profound point, and I think it will it increasingly resonates with policymakers. And it goes into the sort of broader question of um, building constituencies, um, like in the agricultural sector, um, that will support the drive to renewables. So in short, I think it's a great question. And I think the answer is yes, but it's a question of choice. Uh, but we now have the possibility of, of thinking that way. Um, uh, uh, and I, I think that's a very profound point that was brought up. Thank you so much, um, Nate. Um, Ify, would you like to say something? I, well, I, I just want to agree with Nick to a large extent. Um, I, I do think that um, where we have seen mini grids effective in rural communities is to see how it's transformed those communities and people being able to have a quality of life that you literally can have in a city. And so, you know, you find that the with what he said about COVID and, and that sort of reshaping the way people think, the way people walk, the way people live. Um, all of those assumptions around city life are being you know, turned on their heads. But even beyond that, I mean, Nigerians have also been, you know, we have this sort of uh, attachment to our, uh, our ancestral homes. So you do find us traveling back to our villages where we come back from, whether it's during Easter holidays, Christmas holidays, um, for the Eid holidays. And one of the things that I have noticed when I do travel back home is that there are lots of solar um, systems that are mounted in, in houses in a way that they didn't exist about three, four, five years ago. Um, and so you find that people are beginning to adopt that means of electrification, no longer waiting for the grid. Um, and then are questioning whether they really have to go back to the city. Even in Lagos State, that is such an urban commercial nerve center of the country. A lot of people are moving to the, to the outskirts of the city and to the neighboring states, to Ogun State, for instance, and trying to commute in from there if they have to, uh, into Lagos to do anything, maybe a bit of shopping and stuff, but have decided they, they want nothing else to do with Lagos except live you know, outside of Lagos. So we do know that that's happening. Um, at what scale? I don't know that there is any data to support that. We probably have to push a Bureau of Statistics that, that sort of tracks those movements to put some numbers um, to even help with the decision making or even the thinking around how electrification patterns are shaping out. But yes, everything Nick said. Thank you so much, Foma. Uh, Marika, I hope that those answers um, uh, are sufficient for you. The next question is from Pakunle Rotimi, and he's saying, what is the future plan for um, tariff? I'm sure he's probably going to say, what's the future plan for the reduction of tariff on solar, um, given the fact that the government might bring up issues of tax Nigeria? So right now, there's a, there's a high tax. VAT is really when you import solar products into Nigeria. So when you or clear it in the customs, that's a high. And just Ifi Malu mentioned this when she was um, talking, talking about how um, that's a big problem now. So how do we incentivize more companies to actually um, invest in Nigeria in the clean energy space? 
Um, if you have any um, thoughts or comments on this question, on the future of the tariff uh, of um, solar Actually, I'll, I'd love to hear Ifanyi's view as a developer um, <laughs> on this particular issue. Uh, just because, you know, I, I, I have my own views, but I, I'd love to hear what he thinks about there being a tariff on, on solar and, and what that would mean for developers like him. Um, yeah, if I, please, can you um, answer? What, you, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, uh, th thanks, Ife, for always putting me on the spot. <laughs> yeah, so uh, ba basically, from, from a developer perspective, I think... Uh, in, in Nigeria, it's been a, a long-running conversation on uh, the the impact on the tariff vis-a-vis uh, -vis driving and achieving skill and achieving uh, universal access for for energy uh, as an as an industry through the Renewable Energy Association of Nigeria and with support from uh, several uh, partners, we've collectively uh, been engaging the, the government on this. And uh, from, from a government perspective as well, the, the pushback has been on, on how it impacts or, or how it affects the, the revenue and bottom line of government and trying to use it as a means to stimulate uh, local uh, manufacturer assembly or, or similar activities. But it's, it's pretty much uh, uh, to... If, if the government will, will, uh, is able to perhaps grant duty waiver for uh, a couple of years on uh, these RE equipment and come up with a mechanism whereby those concessions can be tracked or to ensure that it, it has uh, corresponding impact on the electrification rate, then I believe it will go a long way in helping drive and achieve the, the, the level of impact we, we all aspire. I agree with you. And I know that there's um, work on the ground now, working on um, trying to see how we can um, d decrease the, the, the VAT for solar products. So I'm sure that in coming months, we're going to hear more about that and such maybe um, suggesting or recommending policies to the government. Yes, and then as well, we have a, another question from an anonymous person. Let me just give a background to this question. So you know how there's an increase in solar products, there's an increase in you know batteries, as an increase in solar panel in Nigeria in the RE space, and you know this actually you know brings up the issue of e-waste, electronic waste in the country. So on one side, it's doing good. And on another side, there's a potential for um, harmful effect on the on the environment. So I think the question here is, um, how do we um, walk towards that as a developer? If I what are your plans to mitigate or you know minimize e-waste? Yeah, so uh, th thanks, Queen. I think uh, the, the, aside the uh, skill, the, the potential skill gap issue that the, the sector will be facing in the country in the, in the near term, the second biggest issue that we envisage and which can also uh, translate into a, a huge opportunity is around how the uh, waste generated from uh, RE. Uh, equipment and activities are uh, handled in, in the coming years because considering the the level of capital and the level of activities going on, on, on in, in the renewable energy space on both uh, pico solar home systems and solar home system and also uh, mini grids then it's it's only uh, obvious that in the next couple of years we'll be having a waste issue in our hands and for, for us in, in, in GVE, part of the way we tackle this is through uh, a, from a contractual basis in uh, negotiating with our manufacturers on, on ways to perhaps take back some of these and on a recycle for rebate or, or similar scheme. Thank you, Ifai. Um, Ifai. 
If I can just add to what Ifani said. Um, so we have in Nigeria, we're developing an e-waste policy. Um, Clean Tech Hub, uh, you know, was be, it's been funded by both the GIZ and the FCDO um, under the African Clean Energy uh, Project to work on both an e-waste policy and a battery end of life um, policy. So the e-waste policy is actually going to turn into a regulation and the battery uh, program, battery recycling program is going to feed into that. Um, so there's already work on the ground with the authorities working with the Ministry of Environment um, and then the Nigerian uh, NESRA, what's NESRA's whatever, I, I forget what the, they stand for now, um, but they are the regulatory authority when it comes to issues around the environment um, in trying to get these policies um, up and running and then also get them into regulations, which would then have a presidential assent um, and make sure that everybody, every, not just in the renewable energy sector, because the e-waste is the e-waste sector is much wider than the renewable energy sector, but actually putting protocols that people would have to follow in terms of um, end of life, you know. So that that work is ongoing. Um, just to put that out there. Yeah, absolutely, Ify. Thank you so much for um, shedding more light into that. So the African Clean Energy Technical Assistance Facility together with Clean Tech Hub have um, put together a guidance document in support of the government body, NESRA, uh, which deals with environmental standards. And um, so we actually did a workshop on that last week. So if you want to learn more about that, um, any developer in here or any um, company coming into the space, that, that's something to look into. And right now a policy is, is underway so, so far, so good on the questions and the answers. I see more coming in. I just want to touch base on finance. Today, uh, we saw a company, renewable energy companies, um, Society um, Renewables, that was 100% funded through a crowdsourcing uh, platform. And I just wanted to um, bring um, Ify to talk more about that in the sense of she, since she has 20 um, companies that she is um, incubating. Um, how do you help this company? How do you help these entrepreneurs, um, you know, enter into the market given the constraint on finance? That's an amazing question, Queen. Thank you. Um, so, a lot of our a lot of our uh, investees or our portfolio companies are currently uh, being guided towards social impact funders, right? So the all um, um I forget their name now. So there are some social impact uh, funding uh, um, opportunities that exist in the Nigerian market, and those are their takeoff funds. But what, what we're trying to work with them on is actually thinking beyond the short and medium term, but also thinking be you know, thinking a bit ahead in terms of how, because that helps in how they're designing their businesses um, and also their operating models as they're building up um, and knowing even if they want to pivot at any point. So when they want to go through their first round of fundraising, um, what should that company begin to look like to make sure that they're attracting the right sources of funding? So in the beginning for the incubators, because they're very, very early stage, it's a mix between grants and, and social impact uh, investments. Um, some of them even apply for the Tony Elumelu um, Foundation grants, um, which is part, part uh, grants, part investments. Um, so with this, they're able to have a bit of takeoff fund um, that they can actually use to begin to deploy their systems and try to build a commercial model out. But then the question for us, which is what we're still grappling with, because for the 20 of them that we have in our portfolio right now, None of them have gone through a big round of fundraising, but preparing them through that is also thinking through what that would look like and helping them think about what their businesses are going to be positioned as to do that. Okay, thank you. I'd like to hear um, Nicholas come in on this and giving his experience uh, with venture capital. Yeah, I, I am delighted to touch on this. Um, uh, I think we do need to generate new models. I think one of the dangers of startup culture and borrowing from the Silicon Valley model is, you know, C round, A round, B round. I'm not sure that that model is purpose-built uh, for uh, the challenge at hand. 
um, and, and for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is uh, liquidity reasons for investors getting their exits. Uh, it's unlikely many of these companies will be listed on a public stock exchange or will have a traditional trade sale to a larger company. And besides, why do we want to exit these businesses? Um, uh, so I think we need to question that. Uh, I've always felt that um, if you can get non-dilutive financing, as they call it, i.e. grants and or purchase orders, that's much better. I think if we're going to borrow from any culture here, it's more European culture than American culture in the sense that uh, make sure your business is cash flow driven uh, and not uh, uh, enterprise value driven, if you can call it that. Secondly, however, uh, on the crowdfunding side, I know many, many, many Nigerians, as we all do on this call in the diaspora, who are keen to make a contribution. Um, I mean, in Canada alone, where I am, there are nearly 10,000 Nigerian petroleum engineers in Alberta. And they've all made a lot of money, and they're all seeing the future arrive and realizing there's a change that's required. How do they get involved? How do they support this? So some kind of... Uh, crowdfunding um, a mechanism to enable Nigerians living around the world in the UK, Canada, and beyond, I think is a, is a brilliant idea. And then last but not least, if one is insistent upon using the more traditional tools of venture capital, there are uh, initiatives uh, around the world that are enabling philanthropists to come into this kind of space, but as equity investors. And I think the best example that comes to mind is the Prime Prime uh, Investment Group out of uh, Boston, who have uh, taken philanthropic money but put it to work in investment ways because philanthropists see that uh, that is actually necessary. So I think one can go on here. And the last thing I would say uh, is uh, several people touched on the fact that the large oil companies in Nigeria are kind of trying to figure out what the heck they should be doing. And, um, you know, they have assets, you know, whether it's permits or uh, um, infrastructure of one kind that they can put at service that actually can offset the need to acquire uh, equity capital. So thinking kind of out of the box or even forgetting the box uh, and uh, um, uh, to imagine different ways of capitalizing these companies, I think is vital. The traditional VC model is not purpose-built uh, for this, uh, this challenge. Thank you so much, um, Nicholas. That was well said. So we're just trying to see how we can move from uh, traditional um, funding to other options like crowdfunding, looking at you know, Nigeria. Nigeria is very populated and um, a lot of them are doing well overseas and how they can you know, be part of you know, um, changing the energy space in Nigeria. Uh, as well as um, making sure that companies are passion driven and not just all about um, the enterprise itself. Um, we also talked about um, liquidity issues that these um, developers are facing. Um, and um, with that being said, I just wanted to bring in um, Nitya um, on Orca to talk more about that, just to see, um, yeah, we have a lot of companies of, of, or like say, yeah, private companies, private developers who have those issues, liquidity issues. What do you think um, Ocker Solar offers that would actually help to um, mitigate against that, knowing that your product is very scalable and more affordable? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess the financing is always, continues to be a challenge in, diff in different ways. And, and for us, I think we've looked at it in, in two contexts. Um, one is, of course, as a company, and, and that builds on, on what Nicholas was saying about different financing schemes. You know, maybe we don't follow traditional trajectories of a, of a startup, but I'll speak a little bit more on the different financial models that we've looked at in actually getting projects off the ground, because I think that's where we've innovated the most. Um, and that's in, yeah, looking to, and for ways to bring in funding. I mean, I, I think we initially set out with the thought that if we can provide a model that will provide returns, um, the developer can you know, front the capital and then they'll make their money back over the certain, you know, the return of, of the project. But that wasn't the case. A lot of developers you know, obviously face those, those upfront capital constraints. And so in 
a number of our different markets in, I guess, so far in Southeast Asia, and I'm sure we'll, we'll expand to other places. We've looked at different kind of financial vehicles to basically bring in that, that capital financing from you know, utility um, investors, impact investors, um, and, and then they are the ones getting the returns back from the grid. And, and then the, the mini grid developer themselves is mainly responsible for kind of the deployment and then the ongoing maintenance um and that yeah and that has helped us i guess overcome some of those initial hurdles to uh yeah those upfront capital costs thank you um so we're rounding up in a bit we have like six minutes to go i'm just going to call on if i i think there's a question for you here that talks about what technology um issues are you facing with your mini grids in nigeria Yeah, thanks. And how, do you think, yeah, and how do you think Oka Solar of product can actually help to bridge that gap or you know, um, the solution to the challenge? Yes, look, uh, thanks, Pinto. O over the years, we've faced uh, varying levels of technology, different challenges, like I, I explained uh, earlier on. So at some point, it was uh, uh, how to uh, ensure uh, zero uh, revenue leakage is true, like uh, prepayment systems that can achieve 100% reliability and be able to measure very uh, minute energy uh, consumptions, which is uh, very common in the in some of the communities where where we operate. But uh, over the years, we've uh, to an extent been been able to to surmount that and, and sometime in the, in the past, it, some of the challenges we faced was the, uh, or, or even in, in some of the new locations you're looking at the uh, absence of uh, good internet connectivity in, in these areas. And you would agree with me that technology uh, or internet access plays a, a huge role in uh, driving, uh, driving technology adaptation, especially in, in a sector and an industry as the mini grid and energy access space. So currently we're we we embarking on a pilot uh, with Okra Solar, which uh, especially on the, the, the power share uh, uh, functionality, which we believe uh, or which we think is brilliant and perhaps can help some of the issues of, uh, around the uh, 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 excess capacity in some of the operating assets. Okay, thank you so much. Um, absolutely well said. Um, I just want to call on, on Williams. Williams has uh, been very excellent in the chat box, in the QA box. Well, I just want to shed more light on these questions about um, what customizations need to be made to hardware for the productive assets. So we're talking about the value chain in the degree system. So I'll start by just saying that I think there's just a general lack of data uh, at the ground level in terms of what the, what the needs are uh, of the farmers uh, in terms of processing, for example. Um, and then uh, not only that, what processing equipment actually is suitable for what crops. Um, and there's starting to be some research done by organizations like A2EI, which looked at Tanzania, RMI, which looked at Nigeria, uh, and started to um, start to put some data around the link between machine, which, what type of machinery is suitable for what type of crops. Uh, so that's helpful. Uh, but you also, I think, you know, except with the exception perhaps of uh, solar powered irrigation pumps, where there's a fairly a mature supply chain coming from India, from China, uh, and from other markets, and that market's fairly, fairly, you know, scaling, scaling fairly quickly. Um, you know, the, the same is not true for processing. Uh, and I think that there's a lack of standardization uh, within processing in terms of quality and quality assurance. Uh, there's issues around uh, compatibility, AC, DC, uh, et cetera. So I think there's, um, 
quite a bit of, of, of work that needs to be done in terms of trying to standardize that supply chain from a processing perspective. Um, I think, I don't, I don't know the, the lay of the land with regards to cold storage. That's another piece of the agricultural value chain that's really critical. Um, but I can tell you that, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of work that's being done more on the, the business model side than I, I think on the technology side, although that's probably an area that, that needs uh, additional attention as well. So that's just some of the initial thoughts that uh, I can share with you on, on, that, on that question. Yeah, well said, Williams. And I'm um, talking about the cold storage. I know that there's a buzz around that. And I know that there's a few companies that have won um, some grants on that from Oxfam and SE for All and just doing things around that. So it's interesting to look to see more what you know um, technologies can do to bridge the divide between energy and, and food security. Thank you. So we've come to the end of this and I just want to do like just like a one a round of questions for all the panelists. And I'll just um, start off with um, Nicolas. I just basically want to ask you, um, being a venture capitalist, what do you want to see developers begin to do apart from being more passionate, driven? Um, what else do you think they need to do to um, make their business more um, viable for investors? Uh, thanks, Queen, for the last chance to make my last point here. Uh, though I'm going to just sort of repurpose the question a little bit, if I may, and just say uh, we haven't talked about gender on this call. And um, so for two reasons I want to bring that up. One, as we all know, there's no development in Africa unless women are empowered. I'm not saying that as an ideological thing. It's just the reality of, on the ground. And, um, and too much of the energy access stuff has ignored the gender dimension. Um, and then the second um, uh, observation is that if you're looking for international capital, uh, don't necessarily go after the, the, those who are interested in energy per se. They, it, there are many, many investors, uh, impact investors who are interested in women's empowerment, uh, figuratively and uh, metaphorically and otherwise. And, and so I think gender is vital. Uh, both for the success on the ground, but secondly, uh, to attract uh, capital from uh, motivated uh, investors around the world. And uh, and I and I just that that's not an optional thing anymore. It's not an add-on. It's it's got to be baked into the design. Otherwise, we are working in parallel, um, and um, and we're stuck in the siloed approach that no longer works. So that's my strong call out is that. We have to uh, we have to bring gender into every aspect of what we do. Thank you so much, Nicolas. And I have a gender lady here, uh, Informa, doing great in the sector. So my question is twofold for you. Given your portfolio of the twenty innovation uh, businesses that you're working with now, what technology have you seen unlock the market the most? And also, um, being that women are a key user of um, energy. Um, what what technologies do you think should uh, you want to see more to help the female gender in Nigeria? So I don't know about being the gender <laughs> champion in any way, but um, I'll just say very briefly and to answer the question that you asked, Nicholas, I, I think I'm a fan of the work that um, Power for All is doing for obvious reasons. Um, the energy access nexus thing where they're looking beyond energy access and looking at very creative ways to connect different value chains, different industries. Um, and so that brings in the interest that Nicholas was talking about um, into the sector through unaligned partners or people who wouldn't ordinarily be interested in core energy issues or energy access issues. So I encourage everybody to look at their website or even follow them on, on social media and see the work that they're doing. But to quickly answer your question, solar seems to be the most popular um, amongst our investee companies, our portfolio companies, sorry. Um, and, uh, but we've, we've begun to see a lot more biogas and biomass projects um, driven by women, specifically because, you know, these are, the, you know, you see women who are making briquettes, um, a lot of the work around clean cooking, 
um, those things serve women the most, especially in the communities that we work in. And so you see that there's been a lot of focus on, 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 on conversations around clean cooking and how that empowers women in communities and all of the narratives that are built around safety, around you know, um, economics uh, when it comes to clean cooking, um, but also the fact that women are able to make money through that. Um, so we see that growing. We see the whole biomass conversation growing as a result of that. But, you know, solar seems to still be the most predominant. And we have a lot of powerful women running um, solar companies in Nigeria. At least 46% are the last count. So we're not doing too badly. The uh, number globally is 33%. So you're above average. Oh, wow. So there you go. <laughs> So much. I just found out manage supply chain logi and logistics effectively. I'm um, given that um, access to electricity are in the Queen, I think we've lost you. I think she was asking if I knew some questions around supply chain and what the challenges were, if I got her correctly. So that, that's the much I heard anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think that's much. Uh, yeah, it looks like Queen has dropped off the call, um, but I believe the question she wanted to ask was to Ifani, and it was, what are the major supply chain issues you face at the last mile in Nigeria? And what have you done uh, with logistics companies to try and overcome these uh, supply chain issues as well? Yeah, thanks for, for the question. So basically, uh, uh, Ife and perhaps everyone who's uh, in Nigeria would agree with me that logistics continue to be continues to be a very uh, huge challenge, especially when it has to do with reaching uh, the last mile, especially also because of the uh, huge uh, deficit of infra in, in infrastructure in, in the country and uh, also recently uh, security issues as well. But Basically, as GVE, we tend to uh, outsource our logistics to reliable uh, uh, logistics services providers. And that has significantly helped us to solve that problem in uh, the couple of past couple of years. Okay, thank you very much, Ifani. So it doesn't look like Queen has been able to log back on. So I would just like to quickly thank everyone, all the attendees and the panelists for joining this great discussion. We hope you learned a lot and are inspired. And yeah, that brings us to the end. So thank you very much for joining and we hope to see you all next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It was a pleasure to get to speak with everyone and learn from you. And yeah, looking forward to, to hearing from anyone who has more questions. Feel free um, if you may, if you have more questions that you feel haven't been answered. Thank you. It was very engaging and have a good evening. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.